Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome back to another Arvind Gottlieb Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station, and I'm excited to have you joining me on this lovely June afternoon. Uh, now, uh, thank you to everyone who's been tuning in for the past uh, bunch of weeks. We've been doing this nearly uh, 10 weeks. I believe this is actually our 10th week where we are live streaming. So. Uh, if you've been watching and following us all along, thank you so much for supporting us. And if you're tuning in for the first time, that's cool too. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you, all of you supporting Union Station uh, in this way. I also want to shout out our uh, 10,000 Union Station members. Thank you for uh, supporting Union Station uh, throughout our closure and when we are open as well. Um, so uh, Welcome to our live stream. So today's live stream is on Wednesday, and as you know, Wednesday is our deep dive live stream day. Uh, we've covered a bunch of topics on this uh, live stream series. We've taken a tour of the solar system. We've learned about stellar evolution. We've uh, uh, checked out the golden record, which is a message that humans have sent out to the stars. We set up a telescope live in my apartment uh, living room, and uh, we also talked about some fantastical universes of fiction, where we talked about fictional universes and how astronomy relates to them. Um, we covered universes like Star Wars, Game of Thrones, uh, a bunch of cool stuff. And remember, if you missed any of those live streams, you can find them all uh, on our Facebook pages. Uh, recordings of all of our previous live streams are there, so uh, you can pop that on right after this one if you're looking for something to watch during dinner. Um, but uh, due to popular demand, our... Uh, uh, Universes of Fiction live stream was so popular uh, and there was so much to cover we actually didn't have time to cover everything so we are coming back for round two our second uh, live stream covering Universes of Fiction and uh, we've got a topic that I think you guys uh, will find quite magical <laughs> we are going to be talking about Harry Potter in fact you can't see it but uh, I am actually uh, pre uh, coming to you live uh, from the astronomy tower in Hogwarts they do have great Wi-Fi here um, so we are going to be learning a little bit about how astronomy relates to the Harry Potter universe, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the science of astronomy that uh, they study in the Harry Potter universe as well. Um, this kind of goes without saying, but there is likely to be major spoilers for the Harry Potter book series, uh, and potentially some of the Fantastic Beasts movies that I know you all have seen and love. Uh, so if you have not read the Harry Potter book series and want to avoid spoilers, uh, then go ahead and pause this live stream, read all seven of those books, and then come back and finish watching this live stream. Uh, you should be able to do that in a, a, just an afternoon. Um, so uh, yeah, again, spoiler warning. We are gonna talk about spoilers in Harry Potter. Okay, so with that being said, and hopefully we didn't lose too many uh, watchers for our live stream, um, and I will avoid some gigantic plot spoilers, so don't worry about that too much. But we will be talking about some characters that appear in uh, later in the book series. So uh, I know a lot of families like to watch right now, so maybe uh, when I start talking about that, you can just cover the kids' ears so they aren't spoiled. Um, but really, if you haven't read Harry Potter to them yet, then what are you waiting for? Come on. It's like the one of the best book series ever. Almost as good as Twilight. <laughs> just kidding. Although Twilight's great if you love it too. I'm trying not to be too controversial on here. Um, uh, one more thing, I wanted to give a special shout out uh, to one of my colleagues, Sherry. Uh, she uh, helped to actually write a whole show all about uh, Harry Potter that uh, we uh, presented at the Planetarium last summer, I believe. Um, so big shout out to Sherry. Thanks so much for uh, putting a lot of this information together. I owe a lot of that to her. Um, she gives a great star tour, so be sure to check out uh, our uh, live star tour at the Planetarium, and you will you can uh, catch her in there giving a star tour, and she's really awesome. So thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, so we are going to just dive right in to the Harry Potter universe, and we're actually going to kind of start with a familiar site. We are going to uh, head on over to Stellarium again. Uh, and this is our virtual planetarium software that we've been using for our uh, What's Up live streams, our Star Tour live streams. Those are happening on Monday, or they happen on Monday at uh, 6 p.m. Um, so if you missed that for this week, um, you can check out the recording of that live stream we did uh, on June 1st this week, uh, this Monday, where we covered the night sky and we talked about different stars and constellations you can see in the week. Um, but we're going to use this for a lot of our uh, live stream today, uh, probably most of it, honestly, just because... Um, uh, J.K. Rowling, when she was writing the Harry Potter series, 
uh, actually used astronomy uh, and different features of our night sky as inspiration in a lot of cases. Uh, and we're going to cover uh, some of those, some you may be familiar with, some that might be a surprise to you. Uh, and we are going to start in our Kansas City sky here. I'm going to skip over some of the normal spiel I give uh, when I'm talking about the night sky. If you'd like to learn more about the night sky and why things like light pollution exist, uh, as well as some constellations that we're going to gloss over today, then be sure to check out those Monday live streams. Now, but we're going to go ahead and let that sun set to bring out the stars. We're going to head on over to about uh, 10 o'clock. Um, although for this stream, we are going to be jumping around in time a bit. Um, so I hope you all brought your time turners. Um, fortunately, uh, our software has a built-in time turner uh, because there are going to be different features of the night sky we're going to be looking at uh, today that um, are going to be uh, just at different times of night or different times of the year. And I'll mention that when we cover them so you know uh, kind of what we're looking at. And so we're going to start out in the north where we actually normally start out. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to kind of gloss over the Big Little Dipper, but I do want to just remind you where they are. Uh, these two famous asterisms, they're good, uh, they're good points in the sky that kind of um, align you to, you know, where things are so you can find north and that'll help you find other objects. That is Polaris indicating the North Star, uh, which indicates north, as you can see, geographic north. Um, but I wanted to point them out because they are going to help us find our first constellation, which relates to Harry Potter. A constellation we've not mentioned during our uh, star tours yet, and that is the constellation Draco, the dragon or serpent. And this constellation is a little bit dimmer than our dippers, but it sort of snakes around in between them. Uh, so you can kind of imagine sort of a serpenty shape kind of going between them here. Um, oop, let me. Oop. <laughs> Still, uh, there we go. Still getting the hang of. <laughs> still, sorry, I'm here. I'm using keyboard controls, which, as you can imagine, you know, are a little bit different than uh, using a telescope. So, uh, bear with me here. All right. So there is the constellation pattern for Draco the serpent with its head, and you can kind of imagine maybe some fins or very stubby wings there. Uh, if you want to imagine as a dragon, uh, we can go ahead and pop up the art there. Uh, ooh, that looks really interesting on this software. Um, so uh, this is Draco the dragon, uh, and this is a circumpolar constellation, which means that here in Kansas City, at least, we can see it year-round uh, because as the Earth rotates and as our view of the sky changes through the seasons, uh, Draco will always be up in our evening sky. So we'll never, the stars will never set. They'll get close to the horizon, but they'll stay up. Again, we call those stars circumpolar. Um, so, in a mythology, uh, well, Draco, first of all, means dragon in Latin, um, and Draco is associated with a couple different myths, uh, but uh, most, uh, its most well-known association uh, is that it represents a dragon that guarded the golden apples in the Garden of the Hesper Hesperides. I can, I can never pronounce that correctly, um, uh, but this is a, a famous uh, a region, sort of a, sort of a Garden of Eden, you could say, uh, in, uh, from Greek mythology. But as you probably have already guessed, Draco uh, also can be tied to a very famous and prominent character in the Harry Potter series, and that would be Mr. Draco Malfoy. Uh, well, some would say Harry Potter's nemesis through much of the series, and I'll avoid too many spoilers towards the end, I guess. Um, but uh, Draco Malfoy um, uh, well, often played as a foil against Harry Potter, uh, and he... Uh, as many of us know, was sorted into the Slytherin house, and Slytherin is often uh, the Slytherin house is often uh, depicted or represented by a serpent or a snake. Now there are a lot of other constellations that are, of course, connected to Harry Potter. So we're going to continue on here. If I press the right button, there we go. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and we're going to kind of do things weirdly. We're going to head to the east this time. Normally I go to the west first, but we're going to go towards the east, uh, kind of in the southeast actually. There is a very bright star uh, that shines very brightly uh, in the southeast sky tonight, and it'll be shining above the moon. And we can see it near the Liberty Memorial here. This is the brightest star in the evening sky tonight and the second brightest star in the northern hemisphere. This is the star Arcturus. Now, Arcturus is uh, part of a constellation named Bootus. He was a hunter. Um, 
and this hunter was said to be guarding his uh, herd from some bears. The word Arcturus actually means watcher of the bear in ancient Greek. Now there is a character in the Harry Potter series that comes a little bit later on, or is mentioned later on, uh, that this name is associated with, and again there may be some spoilers here, but uh, this is the middle name of Regulus Arcturus Black. Now Regulus Black, uh, Regulus Arcturus Black, or R-A-B, uh, was uh, a member of the Black family, um, and uh, he was originally a Death Eater, who was a follower of, he almost not be named, um, but uh, he uh, was getting kind of fishy of stuff going on with uh, with old Voldy, uh, and he decided to defect away from the Death Eaters. This was back around the 1970s, if we're going by timeline here, in the Harry Potter universe at least. Um, and now, he grew suspicious of Voldemort, uh, I hope you guys don't mind me saying that, um, and uh, he eventually discovered that Voldemort was, uh, again, heavy spoilers, using uh, Horcruxes, um, and uh, he uh, was actually the one who found Salazar, Salazar Slytherin's locket, and if you remember, uh, in the sixth and seventh book, he tried to destroy it. Um, that was the one that was in the cave. Uh, there are some big spoilers I won't mention that involve that, but... Um, but his uh, name, R, or his initials R-A-B, are pretty uh, integral to the plot of that story, as we know. Actually, let me click over here. So uh, this is the Black family tree. We'll reference this a couple times because a lot of the names uh, in the Black family are named after stars. Um, so here is the note uh, that, rep that I'm referencing. Uh, and it was sort of a mystery at the end of the sixth book who, who R-A-B was. I remember when I was a kid. Uh, just uh, the internet lighting up with trying to figure out who that was, um, but it turned out to be Regulus Arcturus Black. Um, and uh, this locket uh, eventually came into the possession of uh, one of our favorite characters, of course. Um, but oops, that's a little too far. Uh, let's go back over here. Um, now, Regulus. Uh, is another star name and that is over here in the constellation Leo the lion. You can find Leo by using this asterism that looks like a backwards question mark. Um, this is the lion's mane and his body. The Regulus is the brightest star in Leo and the Regulus means little king. And so we can see Regulus and Arcturus are in the night sky right now. Now, uh, speaking of horcruxes, um, so this constellation Buotis, uh, in to my eyes, looks kind of like an ice cream cone, uh, sort of spilled over, or maybe I'm just hungry. Um, but uh, this ice cream cone kind of looks like it's spilled because there's sort of a blob of ice cream below it. This is another constellation, uh, and this is the constellation Corona Borealis, and this is uh, that Corona Borealis means northern crown. Uh, and in Greek mythology, this is uh, linked to the legend of Theseus and the Minotaur. It represents a crown uh, given by Dionysus to Ariadne, the daughter of uh, Minos of Crete, uh, after she was abandoned by Theseus. Um, you know, just this just standard Greek drama. Um, but I want to bring this up because uh, there is another uh, famous, or, well, famous uh, notable Horcrux that uh, sort of represents uh, a crown. It's the uh, diadem of Rowena Ravenclaw. Uh, and so uh, we, we don't really know if J.K. Rowling took uh, inspiration specifically from Corona Borealis, but uh, you know, there it is. Uh, could be could be tied in, or maybe I'm just uh, you know padding the, this uh, stream with extra content. Um, <laughs> just uh, yeah. Okay, so let's go back over to Stellarium, uh, and uh, we're gonna continue on and we haven't adjusted our time we, these are still things you can see tonight this is actually a good time of year to be doing this uh, I've mentioned a couple times during my star tours uh, oh actually I told myself I was gonna remind myself to check the comment section so I didn't miss any uh, comments so I'm gonna do it right now before I move on uh, so oh Kristen is uh, telling me that Hogwarts does not have Wi-Fi in fact it is so enchanted that electricity does not work whoa that's intense uh, I hope that just means like uh, you know human created electricity because you know our brains run on a lot of electricity as well. But still, an interesting fact for sure. I gotta say though, if I was at Hogwarts, I'd probably want some Wi-Fi. Maybe Ilvermorny has Wi-Fi. That's the American school of wizardry. Um, and Sherry is chiming in. Uh, shout outs to Sherry again, uh, who helped me prepare this. Sherry says, uh, yeah, all the members of the Black family are named after stars. Indeed, 
Uh, and so I just, oh, actually, I just remembered I have, oh, I don't have, uh, I, I had the, uh, the tapestry from uh, the uh, wall in the movies, but it was kind of hard to read. So this actually just shows what the tapestry shows, but this is uh, the family tree. Um, and uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, the seconds and the thirds. Uh, so you can see there are actually a couple reguluses here. Um, this is uh, the specific uh, Regulus, uh, who was actually uh, Sir Sirius Black's brother, I think I forgot to mention. Um, but uh, let's actually uh, keep looking at this, uh, because, uh, well, actually, let's let's uh, check out a bunch of these. So there was a Sirius dating back quite a ways, and we're going to talk about Sirius a little bit later in our tour. We've got Arcturus over here. Uh, and let's talk about the name Cygnus. So Cygnus pops up a couple times in the Black family tree. Uh, and Cygnus the Swan is a notable constellation that's rising here in the early summer skies. It uh, has a star that is part of the Summer Triangle, which are these three bright stars that have just risen. As it is just about summertime, these three stars are up after sunset when summer starts. And this star right here is named Deneb. And Cygnus the Swan looks kind of like a big cross in the sky. Uh, this is the swan's neck, its outstretched wings, and tail. Uh, Deneb, by the way, means uh, tail in Arabic there. Um, so again, a Cygnus Black is a name shared by much uh, a few of the members of the Black family tree. Uh, now the star at the head of Cygnus is named Alberio. Um, Alberio uh, is, uh, well, Alberio is a binary star, and um, it kind of, you know, again, this is a bit of a stretch, and I couldn't find any official... A reference uh, saying that this is this was really tied or to or JK Rowling took inspiration from it but uh, the name is very similar uh, to Albus Dumbledore uh, and the word Albus means white or wisdom and the word Alberio uh, also means white so those are at least uh, grammatically linked I guess you would say um, <coughs> linguistically excuse me um, but I just want to mention that there is sort of an Albus uh, Dumbledore there in the sky as well. Uh, that star at the head of Cygnus. Excuse me. Had to hiccup suddenly. All right. So uh, let's see. What should we continue on to? Let's go back to the Black Family Tree. Actually, there are a couple other spots to check out. Uh, there is Cassiopeia, uh, who's another member of the Black family, uh, who appears to be uh, uh, aunt once removed, maybe? I'm not very good at reading family trees um, from Sirius, but uh, so Cassiopeia is a very prominent constellation. Another uh, uh, circumpolar constellation, which um, I should have mentioned earlier. We're jumping around a little bit here more than usual, but we're going to jump back over to the northern sky with uh, the Little Dipper here. And right below the Little Dipper, we can find Cassiopeia, who's a little W-shaped constellation, kind of looks like a zigzag. I'm not going to dive into the mythology of Cassiopeia and her husband Cepheus, because we brought that up a lot during our Star Tour, so I'll just say if you want to learn more about uh, the mythology behind that, then definitely check out one of our Star Tour live streams, our Monday What's Up streams. Uh, so, we are going to continue on, and I think the next thing we should probably talk about uh, will be, yeah, so let's go over, I'm going to have to change our uh, horizon here a little bit because as much as I do love the Liberty Memorial, it is quite tall and it blocks some of our view of the sky. So we are going to change our landscape here uh, and we'll just pick a, oop, there we go, just pick a nice flat landscape for us to see. All right, there we are. So, now this next part, I am going to fast forward a little bit because the, the next few constellations we're going to look at are going to be rising a little bit later in the night. So we're going to fast forward time here and we are going to stay up till, let's just pause around midnight. Now, uh, you'll be able to see these stars in this position uh, in about a month or two because as the Earth goes around the sun uh, and as it rotates throughout the days, um, our view of the stars changes. In fact, um, the amount of time it takes for one star to reach the same position in the sky that it was the day before is not 24 hours, because the Earth is 
moving around the sun at a certain pace as it's rotating. And so as you can imagine, as the Earth is rotating, it doesn't have to rotate quite as far to get to the same sort of relative position because it's moved a little bit along in its path. Now, it's kind of hard to explain, and I wish I had a graphic to kind of show that, but um, this amount of time is about 23 hours and 56 odd minutes, I think. And that's called, ca excuse me, that is called a sidereal day. Um, and that is just the amount of time it takes for objects in the sky to reach the same uh, position. Um, and uh, that was a bit of a rambly tangent, but um, I was mentioning that just to point out that even though the stars are in this position late at night tonight, later on this summer they'll be in this position earlier in the evening. Um, okay, so all that to say, we are going to jump into a constellation uh, called Ophiuchus, which is not a constellation itself related to um, uh, Harry Potter, but uh, it is a constellation that is related to our next, uh, oops, it just popped up for me, our next uh, tie-in with Harry Potter, and that is uh, Serpens, the Serpent. Um, and there we go. Um, now, uh, the Serpent and Ophiuchus are very closely tied together. Um, uh, Ophiuchus was a sort of a s snake charmer or somebody who fought snakes. Um, he was also associated with magic and healing. So there's some versions of stories that involve him uh, killing a snake and bringing it back to life. Um, and in fact, uh, there are depictions of medicine that involve snakes that uh, some argue are tied to Ophiuchus. But, but again, that snake, uh, the serpent, is uh, definitely tied uh, to Harry Potter. In a lot of ways, um, there are a lot of famous serpents in Harry Potter lore. There is, of course, uh, Nagini, uh, who is one of the Horcruxes. Spoiler alert! Um, and uh, everybody's favorite moment from the final Harry Potter film. And then, of course, there's the Basilisk, uh, which is in uh, prominent in the second book of the Harry Potter series. Uh, and this serpent uh, somehow was crawling through the uh, the like air conditioning ducts uh, or the sewer lines of Hogwarts, which uh, just tells me that their uh, sewer system must have been pretty robust if that giant uh, basilisk could uh, slither through that. Um, but uh, this is interesting, and this sort of ties back to mythology in a way, because uh, if you'll recall from the second book, this serpent was notable for uh, turning people who saw it indirectly into stone, and it was said that if it, you looked at it directly, uh, it, would, it would kill you. Um, and the people who looked at it indirectly were just petrified. They were sort of frozen, not completely turned to stone. Um, but this is a reference to, um, you know, a lot, a, a couple different stories from mythology, but most notably uh, Medusa, who was a monster in mythology that had the ability to turn people to stone. And she was notable because her hair is often depicted as being made of snakes. All right, so that is uh, Serpens, uh, the snake. Uh, of course, uh, the snake represents... Uh, the house of a uh, Slytherin, uh, and that's tied into the language parcel tongue, of course. All right, Let's turn those on. Oh. Oh. There we go. Popping back over here. All right. So let's, uh, let's skip ahead here. And actually, we're going to skip ahead in time once again, even later in the evening. Uh, there are a couple notable constellations that are rising later tonight that are notable for our later summer skies. Uh, that is Scorpio or Scorpius. Um, not a specific tie to Harry Potter there, but a very bright and prominent constellation. And then right behind it is a constellation Sagittarius, the centaur. Uh, this constellation is uh, well known for its famous asterism, which is called the teapot. It's a very easy to spot teapot shape. Here's the handle, the lid, and the spout. Uh, and this teapot is part of a uh, centaur constellation, who is also an archer. The word Sagittarius means archer. So some people say this is his bow and his arm, and that's his body, and he's pulling a bowstring back. Um, you can kind of imagine a similar shape there. Uh, so this, uh, there is uh, a centaur character uh, that pops up a couple times in the Harry Potter series, Ferenz, and in fact there are many centaurs that live in the Forbidden Forest. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and Harry uh, meets uh, this character in the very first uh, story in Harry Potter, and then uh, Ferenz is involved later on in the story, I'll avoid spoilers, but um, 
uh, Friends actually ends up saving uh, Harry Potter from uh, the Dark Lord's attack. Um, uh, now the centaurs are interesting. They pop up a bunch of times in the Harry Potter series, uh, and they are huge fans of astrology. And we'll talk about astrology in general in just a minute, um, but that is kind of their big thing. Uh, they love astrology. Let's uh, go back over here. Now, for this next portion, uh, we are going to have to fast forward quite a bit um, all the way to the early morning sky. In fact, we are actually going to have to change our time scale a little bit. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to pop up this date and time window. We can change the, the date. And so we're going to go ahead and make it, uh, we'll make it, uh, oh, this is uh, 24 hour time. Uh, we'll make it uh, 10 p.m. And we are going to just bump up the months just over to December. And so then at this uh, last constellation that I'm going to reference is a prominent constellation uh, in the uh, winter skies. So uh, that is why I have rewound time here. So you probably won't be catching this constellation tonight, but it is very bright and famous. So chances are you recognize it. Uh, and it is Orion the Hunter. Orion the Hunter is the brightest constellation in the entire night sky. You probably recognize these four stars outlined by Orion's famous belt. Now, Orion is also a character uh, referenced in Harry Potter, at least. He is uh, one of the Blacks, and actually, uh, that was um, uh, Sirius's father, Orion Black. Now, so, um, I've gone over here. Uh, so, yeah, so Orion is uh, a really great constellation, and uh, his story involves... Um, uh, the constellation Scorpius. He very famously fought a giant scorpion monster uh, after he incurred the wrath of the Greek gods. Um, but his stars uh, are notable because they their names correlate with many Harry Potter characters. Um, oh, Sherry is mentioning in the comments, by the way, Ophiuchus uh, means serpent bearer. Uh, so there we go. All right, uh, so yeah, let's uh, talk about these stars in Orion. Um, so the uh, uh, there we go. So the star in the upper left corner here, uh, this bright red one, is called Beetlejuice, uh, and that is translated uh, as Armpit of the Mighty One, which is a great band name if that's not taken already. Uh, and then on his right shoulder is a star called Bellatrix which means female warrior. And I'm guessing you might recall a very famous uh, Bellatrix from the Harry Potter series. Of course, Bellatrix Lestrange, who is actually a member of the Black family uh, by blood. Uh, and she, uh, well, she uh, stirred up some stuff in the Harry Potter series. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I believe this is a screenshot from a very intense moment. Uh, so, uh, spoiler alert for the fifth book. Um, but uh, Bellatrix Lestrange, uh, again, another member of the uh, extended black family, and her name being Female Warrior. Um, and back on over to our night sky here. Uh, now, the constellations in, or sorry, the stars in Orion's belt here uh, kind of form a nice little line. And if you extend that line down towards the horizon uh, to the left of Orion, uh, you can find a very bright star. In fact, this is the brightest star in the entire night sky. Seriously. This is the star Sirius. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Um, so Sirius uh, is the brightest star in the entire night sky, like I said. Uh, Sirius is nicknamed the Dog Star. It's part of a dog constellation named Canis Major. This was Orion's hunting dog. This is also where the term Dog Days of Summer comes from, because in the summertime you can sometimes catch Sirius rising in the early morning sky. Of course, though, Sirius is mostly associated in the Harry Potter universe with Sirius Black, uh, Harry Potter's godfather and famous member of the Black family. Uh, Sirius Black was an animagus. He could turn into a, a dog and, uh, well, Sirius, the hunting dog. So it's all tied together, you know. Uh, J.K. Rowling was clever with her naming. Some of these things did make some amount of sense. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Sirius Black, uh, kind of cool that that is the brightest star in the night sky. Um, 
and uh, that is, yeah. So that is uh, the main, uh, the the main and most notable uh, connections in our night sky. Those names to the Harry Potter universe. And I did want to uh, go a little broad at the end here and talk a little bit about what astronomy and astrology meant to Harry Potter uh, or the magical world in general. Um, and uh, you might find the answer kind of interesting. Uh, now, there were uh, different people in the Harry Potter universe that did practice astrology. Like I said, the centaurs um, were huge fans of astrology. Um, and uh, But but humans uh, in the Harry Potter universe actually uh, used astrology very similar to, uh, well, humans in the real universe. Uh, there were uh, many references to horoscopes and star charts and uh, famous uh, publications like the Daily Prophet as well as Spellbound magazine. Um, uh, and uh, they also studied astrology a little bit in uh, Hogwarts or in uh, magical school, not just Hogwarts. Um, they uh, covered astrology in fourth year divination class uh, and maybe in other years, but that was when it was specifically referenced in the Harry Potter series at least. Uh, but it was only a sub uh, topic in the divination course, divination being the study of essentially predicting the future. Um, it's interesting though because uh, there is a, an astronomy course that is also taught as a full course uh, in uh, many wizarding schools as, such as Hogwarts um, and uh, wizards actually studied a lot of the same science uh, that humans study when it comes to astronomy. Um, they spent their astronomy lessons uh, learning names of stars, movements of the planets, um, and uh, this was a required class from uh, year one all the way up till five, and then it became an elective for your final uh, two years. And there was a mem uh, part of the fifth year uh, exam, the uh, ordinary wizarding levels exam, the OWLs, uh, that um, they had to fill out a star chart. So they actually had to memorize posi positions of stars. Um, and this is one of the only fields uh, in the wizarding world that is essentially equivalent uh, to the muggle world, which is uh, kind of cool because, uh, you know, these are important and interesting things for everybody to learn. Uh, so there were uh, references in the books uh, to um, uh, studying different things, uh, like in fifth year studying Jupiter's moons, and uh, they had to write a paper on Europa uh, and how it's covered in ice, and Io, one of Jupiter's moons, being covered in volcanoes. Um, so it's kind of cool that, uh, you know, amongst all this crazy wizardry going on, they also, you know, just studied planets and moons, uh, which uh, is... Uh, Pretty interesting. Um, now, I wanted to uh, just end this tour by covering astrology a little bit more, uh, and we are going to return ourselves back to our evening sky. Uh, so we're just going to go over to 10 o'clock tonight. So again, we've returned to June 3rd. Um, and uh, actually, what I wanted to do uh, is return to our daytime sky. So we're gonna rewind time even more, get that sun back up. And you know what, I'm gonna switch back to uh, our Kansas City horizon because this is something I've referenced a bunch in my star tours talking about ast astronomy and astrology. Um, but I actually uh, found a way oop, to uh, show you guys it in a little bit more detail using Stellarium. Um, so, and now astrology and astronomy are two different topics, as we know. Astrology is a fun hobby for some people, muggles and wizards alike, where they uh, use constellations to predict things about people like your horoscope or your personality. Um, astronomy is the study of the science of uh, space and planets and the sky, uh, and it's based on science and observations, what we can observe and measure. Um, so these are two different topics, and it's best not to get them mixed up. But astronomy and astrology are connected uh, in an interesting way. Uh, and uh, so actually, I, I did want to start in our evening sky. So we're going to go back to nighttime, back to 10 o'clock. Now, there are uh, constellations we have talked about that are part of the zodiac signs, the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which are the 12 constellations associated with astrology. There is Castor and Pollux, which are, uh, or sorry, Gemini the twins. Uh, these two stars are named Castor and Pollux. There are twins in the Harry Potter series as well, of course, Fred and George, so you can maybe see some ties, tie-ins there. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just checking the uh, comments section, uh, and uh, Michelle is asking me what house I'm in. Uh, now, of course, I uh, don't have a visa, so I can't attend Hogwarts, but uh, as a, uh, a 
as a, a former pupil of the Ilver Morning School, um, I uh, typically associate it with the Puckwudgie House. That's a real thing. Uh, look up the uh, American Wizarding School houses because they're pretty entertaining. Um, so, all right, so back to our night sky here. Uh, Gemini the Twins, that is uh, one of the Zodiac constellations. We've also got uh, Leo the Lion. Uh, we have uh, Virgo the Maiden, and we have a couple other the couple uh, couple others that are hiding behind here. Um, but I actually have a useful little script that I wrote that will just go ahead and turn them all on for me, hopefully. All right, there we go. So here are our zodiac constellations uh, and Ophiuchus. I'll talk about Ophiuchus in a second. Um, so. Our zodiac constellations there are all follow sort of a line and they extend around our celestial sphere um, so you only see certain zodiac constellations during certain times of year these are the constellations visible uh, in our spring and summer skies in the evening uh, now if you've ever uh, looked at your star chart or tried to figure out your zodiac sign you might have noticed that your zodiac sign is not up in the night sky near your birthday if it's not up in the night sky near your birthday, then where is it? Well, your zodiac sign is actually a lot more closely tied with the sun. So we are going to rewind time now, and we are going to bring that sun back up. And with the power of our digital planetarium here, we can keep the constellations up, because of course in the daytime the stars are still up, they're just hiding behind that blue sky. And we're going to rewind to about noon, where the sun is at its highest point in the sky. And we can see that right now the sun appears to be in front of the constellation Taurus. Uh, we could also say that the sun is in the house of Taurus. Now this line that popped up here has a name. It's called the ecliptic. And this represents the plane of our solar system. So the Earth orbits the sun in a flat disk. And if we extend that disk out into space, that is called the ecliptic. That's roughly in line with the rest of the planets in our solar system, the eight planets in our solar system, not Pluto. Um, and so the planets also will be found close to the ecliptic path as well. In the daytime, however, the sun will be right on top of the ecliptic. But as the Earth orbits the sun, all these positions and uh, things change relative to each other. So right now, three things are lined up. There is the Earth, the sun, and then way behind the sun are the stars that make up Taurus. But as the Earth moves around the sun, the stars that are behind the sun are going to change, or they're going to appear to change. So if we jump forwards in time, um, one day, so you might 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 be hard to see, but keep an eye on the calendar down there because that's going to tell us what day it is. If I jump forward one day at a time, you'll see that it looks like the sun is moving along this path. Now, what I'm doing here is jumping forward in time one sidereal day. That's why everything in the sky is staying in the exact same position. Um, if I jump forwards in time one full day. Um, which I have conveniently forgotten the keyboard shortcut for. Um, oop, and I pressed that to accidentally change. Uh, we want to do... Uh, oh, okay, great. Very easy shortcut. Let's go back over here. Um, all right. So if I jump forward in time one full day, then the sun will stay in the same position and the stars will move behind it. Um, and as you can see, it looks like the sun is passing in front of these background constellations. Now, like I said, the sun is not really moving. It's the Earth that's moving. This is our, just our perspective. It's like when you drive down the road and the trees fly by your window. You know the trees aren't really moving. You're the one that's moving. Uh, now, it's passing in front of these constellations. And when they say the sun is in the house of your constellation on your birthday, that is meant literally. On your birthday, the sun is in front of one of these constellations. And whichever constellation it's in front of, that is your zodiac sign. Um, now, as you can see, some of these constellations are different sizes. And what I've also put up here are the constellation boundaries. We've talked about this before, but technically, constellations occupy a region of the sky. Um, and as you can see, some of them are way bigger than others. Uh, so when you look at a traditional uh, zodiac calendar, you'll notice that uh, these dates are very uniform. And I'm pulling up. Uh, one of these calendars for you guys to look at. All right, there we go. This one looks good. Nope. All right. So uh, here is 
a traditional zodiac calendar. So if you add up the days in each of these 12 zodiac signs, it's usually very even, about 30 days long, because in astrology, those days are divided, or the year is divided into 12 equal chunks, basically. But as you can see in astronomy, these constellations are not covering the same amount of the night sky, or the daytime sky, rather. And the sun is going to spend more or less time in front of certain constellations. And of course, uh, our lovely memorial is hiding this again, so I'm going to switch out here. Um, for example, the sun is in front of Virgo for way longer than 30 days, and it'll be in front of Scorpio for way shorter than 30 days, just a couple days, in fact. Um, now, remember Ophiuchus, that constellation I mentioned before? Well, it is part of the zodiac here, and as you might be able to see, the sun passes in front of Ophiuchus during a certain portion of the year, actually for more days than Scorpius. Um, so if we go back to this other calendar, you'll see that uh, these dates are completely different. Um, and if you double check your zodiac sign, there is a good chance that it might not be what you thought it was. And also, if you're born between November 29th and December 17th, then congratulations, you are in Ophiuchus. Sorry, by the way, if any of this ruins your horoscopes, um, although now that I think about it, maybe that's what's wrong with my online dating profile. <laughs> JK. So, that is a little bit more information about the zodiac constellations which are just as important in astronomy as they are in, or in, just as important uh sorry in the harry potter universe as they are in the real universe <coughs> which is to say not extremely important because both the magical world of harry potter and the real world of us smuggles uh spend more time learning about astronomy than they do astrology all right that uh brings us to the end of our whoop, main content for uh, our stream today. Now, let me just dive into the comments uh, that I've been missing. Uh, Sherry again, thank you so much. A big shout out again to Sherry for uh, sharing her notes off with me uh, on all this awesome Harry Potter lore. Uh, give uh, She deserves a huge shout out and definitely come by the planetarium to catch one of her amazing star tours. Uh, Bab, thanks so much. Uh, she says, uh, interesting, fun presentation. Jackie, thank you. Glad you love watching. Appreciate it. Uh, and then we just had a question I'm seeing from Eric. Um, were there any comments that were harbingers of a big event in the book series? Uh, and I, in my research, I didn't see, uh, or I didn't see, or I didn't remember. And it's been, I'll admit it's been a little while since I've read the Harry Potter series, but I don't quite remember specifically any comments uh, that were notable from the uh, Harry Potter universe. Um, and uh, I will say that uh, there are uh, many broomsticks uh, for Quidditch that were named Comet as a, a code name. So if you want to buy a Comet broomstick, then uh, that's probably the closest tie there. But that's a good question because Comets are often harbingers of something to come. And there may have, been re in a re may have been a reference in there about some prophecies or things like that, but nothing extremely notable. But good question nonetheless. All right, y'all. Um, well. I hope you guys enjoyed this stream all about Harry Potter. Um, there are a lot of other fictional universes uh, we could cover, and if you're interested in those, uh, please um, let us know in the comments because we can always come back and maybe do another stream about these other fictional universes. Um, there are a lot of other, a lot of other notes uh, from things like, things like other movies, like Interstellar, as well as other fictional universes. Uh, we had a request for Lord of the Rings, which could be really interesting. Um, uh, David just asked, are there any astronomy references uh, to the Chinese zodiac um, and that's a uh, that's a whole other thing so I've mentioned a couple times in our uh, star tours that um, most of the constellations that uh, we learn about in astronomy are based on Western uh, astronomy you know Greek uh, stories as well as uh, European and American explorers in the southern hemisphere um, but there that's we those are not the only stories in astronomy and different cultures around the world see many different things uh, and uh, and there are actually a, a lot of different uh, Chinese cultures uh, that uh, look at the stars in a lot of different ways with their own sets of constellations and, uh, like David said, their own zodiac. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, different cultures' uh, constellation systems, I brought that up a couple times, um, but let me know in the comments if that's a topic you are interested in having us cover. All the different uh, sky cultures, we call them. Uh, different uh, ways we can connect the dots and different ways that people have seen the stars all around the world. And you might be surprised to find that a lot of people around the world see the stars in similar ways because we're all not that different. Um, Michelle asks, are any of the photos on the walls in Harry Potter connected to astronomy? So 
I think we're, she's referencing some of the moving pictures in there. And that would be uh, something I'd have to do uh, reread or rewatch on because there, if I remember correctly, there were quite a few of those moving portraits uh, in the Harry Potter universe. So who knows? There could be a, a couple of little Easter eggs that uh, J.K. Rowling or the filmmakers dropped in there, but definitely something to look out for on the next rewatch. Unfortunately, this does bring us to the conclusion of our live stream for today. Um, now, uh, please stay tuned to our social channels. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium, please do that now uh, because uh, that is where we make all of our announcements about planetarium content, live streams, uh, rocket launches, all the cool stuff like that. You can find our previous streams on there. Uh, but really subscribe to that because uh, we are going to be announcing uh, future plans for our live streaming. As hopefully you all know, we are... Uh, Union Station and the Planetarium are reopening uh, starting next Wednesday. We have a, a very slow and careful plan for reopening. Uh, starting on Wednesday, uh, we'll be beginning with um, Union Station members only, and then the following Wednesday on the 17th, we will be open to the public. Tickets are available right now online if you want to check that out. And if you go to unionstation.org, um, you can find uh, more uh, information and more specifics about those plans. Um, but uh, we have not announced our plans for uh, live streaming in the future. Um, so if you are interested in these live streams continuing in some capacity, your voice is really, really important. I could do these all the time. I love doing them. Um, pretty soon I'll be back at the Planetarium, but we can for sure keep doing these streams if you all want them. So if you want these streams, please mention in the comments. Please tell your friends. Uh, please uh, drop a comment. Send us a message. Uh, send us an email, anything like that, uh, but let us know because we would like to keep doing these. Uh, but do stay tuned. In the next couple days, we will announce what our tentative plans are starting next week for live streams. And then uh, pretty soon we'll announce our plans going forwards into the further future. For now, though, this concludes our stream for today. I have been Patrick Hess, your Planetarium Specialist. If I don't see you for a while, thank you all so much for joining me over the past 10 weeks. I've had a blast doing these all with you. I hope you've learned something, uh, and I hope, I hope you've had fun too. Um, my Favorite thing, so uh, out of all this has been answering your questions and talking to you live on the air. Um, so I hope that uh, you all keep asking amazing science questions. Uh, never stop learning. Uh, and until I see you either here in our virtual planetarium or at the real planetarium, uh, once we reopen, uh, I wish you all a happy afternoon and I will see you all around. Goodbye, everyone.